This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Christopher Hiley, professor of English at The Ohio State University and also director of the university's Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. We will begin with a look at Chris's new book from the Oxford University Press on the curious cultural history of the Blackfriars district in London before, during, and after the Shakespearean period. The book is entitled Blackfriars in Early Modern London, Theater, Church, and Neighborhood. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Chris, it's just absolutely fantastic to see you again. Thank you so much for joining the program. You're very welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, you have a book out. And we've been waiting. I know that um, uh, you've worked on it for some years uh, over, uh, and we we met a few years ago at the Folger during their coffee break and had a, a brief conversation, all too brief, because I'm, you know, I'm very interested in this type of stuff from that conversation. And uh, I, I said, okay, I can't wait for this book to come out. And it's out. Give us the full title of the book. The title is uh, Black Friars in Early Modern London. Um, theatre, church, and neighbourhood. And, and I'm having to look at it myself because the um, the publishers wanted me to change the title kind of at the last minute. Yeah. I um... <laughs> we wanted to make sure the word London came before the colon, right? Originally, I'd had it after the colon, but they thought for marketing purposes, it would be better to have early modern London up front there. I see. Yes, uh, because that's why I asked you to say the title, because I had something else in mind. Also, uh, the, the copy that I have, which is a Kindle copy, we haven't gotten your hard copy in yet. It takes some time. Uh, you know, we're in Tokyo, so it takes some time. And I uh, was uh, slow to order it, I guess, or whatnot. We had a break somewhere in there. and uh, But I've uh, been able to get through it. So I think it works great. Blackfriars in Early Modern London Theater, Church and Neighborhood. You, you go through the whole history, but it really gets going during the period of Cowarden's uh, kind of tenure there, uh, uh, during and after the reign of Henry VIII. Right. And that's where we kind of start. And you move through in a very structured way, first the material uh, environments and uh, very precisely in maps from the period. And uh, also what we know about the architectural um structure and then move into society and neighborhood and uh th there were times there's no way to make the uh exact you know correlation between our time and but it's at times it reminded me a little bit of how people describe brooklyn and new york you know the integration of the neighborhood uh also uh, it, but brooklyn would be of course across the river whereas Black blackfriars was right there in the city uh but not of the city i think as you pointed out uh so yes. yeah Very sort of um, ambivalent status jurisdictionally in jurisdictionally in relation to the city and the corporation insofar as you know af after 1608 the uh, James's um, you know act of, of incorporation didn't nominally give control to Blackfriars and the other liberties to the city but it, it, de facto um, the, the liberties were still largely self-governing and they en en enjoyed certain exemptions and, and you know freedoms from certain taxes and certain city responsibilities one of the hardest things in the research that was actually finding out what practical differences that 1608 act of incorporation actually meant to blackfriars and to the uh, to these other uh, so-called exempt places in and around the, the city um that was one of the frustrating things in the research because a lot of the um the sort of the, the the hard data is from, as you, as you mentioned, it's from early in the early years after the Reformation, the redistribution of, of the properties, um, you know, from the church to the crown, and then and then to these private individuals like uh, Thomas Cotton and his heirs, the the Moors of Losley, 
and you know and, and they you know fortunately their papers survive and so we've got really good property records um you know up through the early 17th century but that, that, then the rec records get much more much thinner and it's kind of harder to follow uh you know developments in both in changes to the built environment and in questions about the relationship between the, the precinct itself and its sort of internal systems of government and the external corporation of London and the Lord Mayor. Yeah, uh, for my students and for uh, people who are not uh, immediately familiar with this period, this is part of the history of the English Reformation and Henry, very specifically Henry's dissolution of the monasteries and the repurposing of church properties and this had a this was a massive it was a uh, time i think alec reary talks about this as a period of mass destruction very much exactly literally mass destruction these these uh large complexes that had belonged to the church to the roman church uh were uh, in some cases destroyed repurposed used in any way you would take a uh, sacred area and make it your living room. Uh, I think there's a, a case in your book with, with uh, Cowarden where he takes out the altar stone so that he can make, uh, and I think you maybe speculate a fireplace or something like that. Yeah, there's he, no he, respect he, at he, all. For, yeah. Takes it yeah. to his country estate. I don't think, I mean, you ought to be careful talking about, you know, dis destruction of these religious buildings after the Reformation. I mean, I, I think it varied a great deal throughout the country. And I think that within, and certainly in Blackfriars, I mean, there was some destruction insofar as uh, Cowarden, um, you know, he turned he turned the old um, Friars Church, the conventual church, he turned that into his private residence. And that involved a, a lot of sort of rebuilding and adaptation, but it, it isn't just kind of wholesale destruction, leveling of, of, this, of this massive friary because as repurposing is, is a much better term as you, you know, and you, you've used that because this is very, you know, these are very valuable and um, attractive stone built um, structures. They just need to be subdivided in different ways and, and used for different purposes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Cowardin, we should uh, also say is the, uh, as I think you, he's the, the little prince of the, uh, of the district. And Blackfriars is not just a, a complex, it is an area, a, a district of London, and it was independent, and it had a kind of independent governance, and he was the first really big figure, and he was Henry's master of the rebels, and I presumably uh, Mary's. Uh, he was he lived till uh, 59, and, uh, and so there you have a, a direct link between that this district and uh, playwright, playwriting, play uh, performing, and the theater. Yeah, he's got the office of the revels there, seem, seemingly as part of his private residence. Um, and then, I mean, and there's there's evidence of um, maybe sort of rehearsals taking place in in this office. And then just across to the east just across the um, the boundary, the precinct boundary into St. Andrews, you've got the Royal Wardrobe, St. Andrews by the wardrobe. So you've got this um, you know, kind of nexus of institutions that are, that are connected to core entertainment and spectacle. Yeah, and one, and one of my arguments is that that sort of facilitates the, 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 the future development of, of theater and other forms of entertainment in, the, in that area. Yeah, and up through to Ben Johnson in particular, uh, some yeah. some decades later uh, from the period, uh, and but also there's a relationship in that in that precinct. I think you you push back as as I like I like this. You push back a little bit against this uh, the, the idea of the, the of the theater and the church being diametric oppose they of course were in kind of competition and there were conflicts but there's an intermixture there too there is a, a way in which one seems to support the other and exist at least exist um if not completely peacefully they existed together theater and church and it's yeah, hard and to I separate could, them i, I just yeah. think it's one of one of the kind of um driving impulses if you want in wanting to write this book was to just focus in on on a particular parish and community and to see how the the theater and the, the church re religion and, and uh secular entertainment how how they 
got on how they operated because too often in the criticism you, you just get these massive generalizations mm -hmm. about this antithetical relationship between church and theater but it's you know it's so much more nuanced than that it does have to do with the individuals and the particular circumstances of the neighborhood yeah uh i think there's one point there uh and let's move forward to the 1590s uh famously most people who have gotten into Shakespeare scholarship at all uh, know something about the fact that uh, there was an attempt to make um, by Burbage to make the Playhouse at the late 90s, roughly the time that the Globe we know was was constructed was another repurposing, you know, the movement of the theater in the Shoreditch down uh, south of the river. Uh, and at roughly the same time, Burbage was uh, purchased an area and I thought before I read your book that this was just kind of a, you know, a, a play space, but there were seven rooms, I believe. And these were fairly, this was a fairly large space that he actually purposed. And there was a petition against the theater. And uh, let's, that's further on in your book, but let's go into that because it might be one of the most familiar moments for Shakespeare people. Yeah. So the seven great upper rooms. Is is the way that that uh, cluster of that space, those spaces are described in the indenture that Burbage um, signs with Moore, um, but it's not clear. I mean, it's always been assumed, hasn't it, that by in in theatre scholarship, that Burbage is um, you know planning to move the, his theatrical operation indoors, um, but. But it, and that he gets blocked and frustrated by by the petitioners who are successful in 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 stopping the the actors from getting in there. But you know maybe maybe he was planning on using this space for something else, renting it out to other companies, or operating an indoor space alongside um, an outdoor amphitheater. Uh, I think we we've, we've too readily assumed that, that Burbage was just going to sort of transition from this the large public amphitheater to this to this private and supposedly more kind of elite mm -hmm. uh, indoor space i mean there's there's lots of different narratives we could develop around around that move and what it means uh well you're very good at bringing forward uh, the major arguments of, uh that have been put out by critics and you, at some point you can only speculate because you just don't know i mean you you, you yeah. don't know precisely what uh, they were trying to do, but the lease was running out at uh, in Shoreditch, and something had to be done if they wanted to uh, keep things going. Uh, if I've got the chronology right, I think Burbage um, gets hold of these Blackfriars rooms before it's clear that they're not going to be able to renew the lease in Shoreditch. Mm -hmm. okay. It's not as though they've lost the theatre and then they have to suddenly get another space and they go for the, the Blackfriars. They seem to be on... The, the possibility is there that that he was envisaging having these, an indoor and an outdoor playing space available. If yeah. Makes sense. yeah. We can certainly talk about the, the 1596 petition by, by some of the residents, because yes, I mean, most that is mentioned a lot in Shakespeare scholarship, gets a lot yeah. of attention. But I, yeah. I, I think it's, a, it's missing. I mean, I just, I try to do some different things with it. I think it's misunderstood. I mean, one of the most obvious questions I asked was, well, you know, here are these, I don't know how many, how many people is it signing? I forget about twenty or so. Yeah, yeah. What about all the other people with, with power and influence in the neighborhood who didn't sign it? Um, you know, communities aren't monolithic, yeah. and even people who might go to the same parish church and apparently have the same religious sympathies might have different positions on a playhouse in their community and have different re reasons for supporting or objecting to the playhouse. Yeah. So again, it's it's really complicated. You can't just assume, as I think scholars have in the past, that this entire community, this which is again falsely seen as monolithically godly, mm -hmm. was against the theater, and this petition kind of spoke on behalf of the entire community. Yes. Yeah. It's all. Uh, at one point, there was a a kind of census that roughly estimated a thousand people. I think that was earlier than the 1590s but at least a thousand people. So you have 20 out of- uh, Oh yeah, you mean re as residents in the Black as, res as residents of uh, Black Friars. I think that's yeah. more, uh, that's earlier. So later there would be probably more if you know London grew during yeah. that period. So- They're trying to figure out the, the population that was, I never really uh, managed that. 
And I, so I'd have to learn more about how you can how you calculate, you know, dem yeah. demographics. Well, as humanists, we can say a lot more than 20 people. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, yeah. And a lot more influential people, even though yeah, they described as crowded, as, as yeah. a crowded space. It's about five or six acres yeah. um, with multi story um, residences, you know, tenements, as they were called. Uh, often, these were often much larger houses that had been subdivided with strangers and inmates living in them on what you know really piling on top of each other so it was extremely was extremely crowded and and yeah the other kind of assumption that i think is false it's often made in in the scholarship is that it was an elite enclave mm -hmm. black, black Friars was an elite neighborhood well sure there were members of members of the elite with houses there but once you start digging into the records you know the um parish registers and whatnot you realize there were people from right across the social spectrum yeah all, all living and living very close to each other there, there wasn't this sort of um and it's funny because black friars was literally a gated community you know it, it was surrounded by the priest the the um, the precinct walls the pre-reformation mm -hmm. walls existed on um to the north and the east and then to the south you've got the river and then to the west you've got fleet river or fleet ditch so it's kind of self-enclosed and there are gates yeah. there are four gates altogether three or four um that were and they had porters they paid porters to actually open and close the gates morning and evening at set times so it was an it was kind of a catered community but it was a very heterogeneous community in, in terms of uh, social makeup. Not like, you know, when we think of gated communities today, we think that they're sort of just exclusively for the rich. It wasn't right. like that. Um, uh, but I think people were influenced probably by images from that period of the palaces along the river. Of, uh, uh, and the, 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 uh, those palaces or the, you know, the residences that were very opulent. Uh, but then behind these areas, you get into the yeah. streets and, well, it's like with, I mean, with those opulent mansions, you're going for, when you go further west towards Westminster, you get the great houses, don't you? Like yeah. Essex House. Essex and, yeah. Yeah, with the, the fantastic gardens leading down to the river. Yeah. If you look at something like, um, the who is it, John Norden, the, the map maker, uh, you know, he's got very detailed images but they they do they don't tend to include you know you know these these tenements and these sort of shanty towns that might have built up around the great houses yeah i think this is a good time to bring in uh janelle genstad's project in, uh at the uh, map of, of early modern london and you're on the board the advisory board i think is that right and uh yeah sure I'm, uh, I'm, I'm and uh, it's changed my uh academic uh, my I, I don't know uh my life <laughs> in some ways that map has because uh, from from the time that i was able to i knew about the map and i'd looked at the map but we usually see these maps in books and you you don't have the ability that we have kind of online now to zoom in and when uh that map went up and i started looking at it there's just just fascinating stuff and as it began to become more and more annotated uh you go wow there is just like your book brings out, uh, there is this whole infrastructure, not just um, physical buildings, but they're very important. Space is very important. But this is changing. These spaces and the way they change and the way they look are changing not only the, the consciousness of the time, they're changing my way of looking at how, how the theater worked and how yeah. a lot of other things worked, people, uh, religion, how preaching worked, you know, how Catholicism in a requisite sort of way survived, you know, through, uh, you know, kind of underground ways. You've talked about that, but just so many things. I'll stay on the theater. There's no Shakespeare without these changes in consciousness that are brought about by the uh, the, the spatial areas and the uh, the types of society that you have. And, and Blackfriars is very much part of that. Um, Absolutely. Just going back to um, the map of early modern London, the, the Janelle Genstead program. So, yeah, I've, I've actually uh, started um, kind of a, a sub um, project on um, the parishes of, of London. So yeah. we're trying to get entries on all of the over 100 parishes in early modern London. And I so I have contributors 
uh, from both historians and literary people working on individual parishes. And, and the idea is to sort of upload primary data when it's available, uh, parish records and what have you for, e for each parish. So we, we can sort of do a sort of a mi micro analysis of these of these communities. And the other thing I, sh I should say is that I'm I'm working with some other scholars toward um, a more dynamic, but towards building a more dynamic map of early modern London, which I mean, map of early modern London is is built on the Agus map, mm -hmm. but it's it's not as detailed as a later post fire map. Um, from the 1680s, I believe. And, and even though it's post-fire, it still shows you the original kind of street layout pre-fire. And so um, with, with a couple of, of colleagues, I think we're thinking of developing a, a map based on this later, it's the Morgan map, o Ogilvy Morgan and Morgan. Map. It's the, but Morgan created his, a, a map by himself, which is really, really detailed. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is to take various um, theater districts north of the river, I, I would take the Blackfriars and, and kind of superimpose a um, a modern reconstruction street map on top of the Morgan map. So you could sort of fade in and out from the Morgan map to this modern reconstruction. The modern reconstruction would um, have a lot more detail than right. is available on any 17th century map or on any modern reconstruction. Um, and then that would be sort of digitally linked to all kinds of, of resources and um, source materials. But this is this is a long a long term uh, map again digital. Yeah. Map. <laughs> yes, a long term project. This is collaborated, of course. Uh, now, Peter, uh, we think of Peter Blaney's reconstruction of the uh, uh, bookstores of uh, Paul's yeah. Cross Churchyard from not really as much visual evidence as uh, the records uh, of how big these leases uh, precisely and putting together yeah. the bookshops from uh, records, which is just, an, it was an, a remarkable sort of thing that he did uh, and getting it down to, you know, how precise it had to be and then drawing up the uh, diagram uh, which again just opened up this whole world. You see where how the I've I, I always wondered before Blaney. I was studying in London and I walked around modern St. St. Paul's and I I was thinking I wonder where those bookshops were because they say Paul's you know it said where were these things and I walked around the cathedral. There's nothing there now that would indicate that kind of space. Actually, if you go to St. Paul's now on the south side, they've they've built the uh, in, in stone or marble that they've built the footprint of the original gothic cathedral oh really oh yes and and so you can see where the um the almoner's house was may have been and they might have book bookshops they, they may kind of hypothesize where bookshops were but that's something worth, really worth looking at it's quite interesting and also there's uh, john wall's Paul's Cross Project, which I'm yes, sure you've yes. Well, I spoke with uh, John uh, almost a year ago about okay. that he, because they've come to the uh, sort of the end of it. They still are doing some uh, few things, uh, but we we have a uh, talk up with that and those. Uh, and I've been fascinated with that. And of course, Paul's Cross, the importance of space and the, how that space is repur re repurposed yeah. and the the detail uh, is absolutely um uh, it, it's just necessary for this kind of scholarship. Otherwise, you just have speculation becomes more and more um, uh, what wild uh, because you're dealing with a cathedral and with buildings and an area. I don't know if you and I were, were able to walk through what would be current day Blackfriars. Um, you know, how much would we be able to see uh, from well, was six in May? <laughs> in May. I yeah, I, I take students to London most Mays to yeah. study abroad. I mean, we missed the the, the COVID years, but yeah. I always I always make my pilgrimage to to Blackfriars and 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 Pauls. And surprisingly, you know the um, the the street pattern is still there. The white, the winding streets, some of the alleys, the the names, and um, you know the great another great fire pretty much destroyed that whole area. But when they rebuilt London. They use the original um, street pattern more or less. They didn't go with a kind of Parisian 
model of radiating streets and mm -hmm. you know sort of uniform geometric scheme they basically used the um the, the property lines that had had once that, that had always been there and this you can still see them today still has that feel and of course there are some um plaques up indicating where um the play approximately where the playhouse entrance was playhouse yard i mean that that name is still there yeah uh, yeah there's a, there's a plaque where the the, um, the Eastern Gatehouse was where the property that Shakespeare bought towards the end of his life. Um, so they've done quite they've done quite a nice job. It's not like the Globe, obviously, on the bank side and the way that's become sort of very commercialized and a, a, a form of popular entertainment. But yeah, it's worth, it's worth walking walking around it. Yeah, well, my first uh, kind of study trip to London was uh, a long time ago. It was seventy eight and uh, nineteen seventy eight. And at that time, and I think for a lot of my students here in Japan and for a lot of people, when you visit London, you don't think of London as the, the borough, the, the modern borough of London. Uh, and, and that threw me off uh, some years ago when I started studying uh, early modern. None of this stuff over in uh, West, um, Westminster, well, there, it was Westminster, but none of the... Uh, uh, the uh, West End type. Uh, when we go to London, it's Trafalgar Square and it's the uh, great uh, museums and then the theaters on the West End and maybe Hyde Park and down around Harrods and that kind of thing. And all of that is farmland uh, in these old maps. And the center of the city is the, uh, roughly speaking, where the uh, cathedral is now, the Dome Cathedral. That's on the West Side and then if you move over, we never went there. I think we visited St. Paul's a couple of times and so forth. Nothing was happening on the south side. And in fact, it was a little um, it was a little dark and dangerous over there, I think, back then. Well, in 1978, I mean, that that was just sort of disused dockland on the yeah. bank side where the globe is. There was, yeah, there was, there was nothing. Yeah. And uh, Southern Cathedral was there. But I mean, we didn't go there. Uh and the, there's a bridge across. I think we went over to, um, where, where is it? The bridge that crosses and goes down to, uh, in, is in the Eliot poem, St. Mary Woolnerth, uh, yeah. that bridge. Uh, but the, And there's a sort of extension of the financial district there. But there was very little in terms of uh, what you might call the historic tourism on that yeah. side. Yeah. And since then, uh, there's been a kind of renaissance there, I'm glad. The, uh, the National was over there, if you go up, uh, you know, across from uh, Westminster Big Ben and all that, there, there was some development there. Uh, but I, I think it's wonderful. I love the pedestrian bridge and the views that you get. You know, the, it just brings so much to right. the fore. Oh yeah, I love the um, you know the, the ones the square mile, right? The real the real city with the, with a tower marking the eastern boundary and then St Paul's. And really, a Blackfriars marking the the western boundary, that one square mile. There, there is so much uh, history there. Um, in the, you've got the Guildhall there. You've got the Roman amphitheatre that's been sort of rediscovered and and opened up to the public. You've got so much. You don't. You really don't need to go to those touristy places in the West End or or wherever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to make sure that we get into the uh, to your you're, you're at Ohio State University, and that was the uh, academic home of our mutual friend and colleague, uh, the the late John N. King, uh, yes. and he was uh, I I know uh, you you worked with him, and he was a dear friend of yours, and towards his later uh, uh, years became a dear friend of uh, my wife and me as uh, he came over to Japan and we visited him in uh, Washington, D.C. and so forth. But uh, he, and you and he and uh, Hannibal Hamlin, you're part of a, a larger fac faculty who you, you do these things. Uh, you look at the history and uh, uh, very grounded in Reformation history. You you look from the Catholic side a lot in your the history yeah. of your scholarship. John looked at the uh, Fox side, the um, uh, Book of Martyrs and the Protestant side. And uh, I know Hannibal works on um, uh, the Bible and so forth. And uh, it, there's a focus there. And in fact, I spoke with one of your old students, uh, Aaron Pratt, who's at uh, oh, yeah. the, the Ransom Center now, which in fact has one of the finer uh, recusant collections around. The recusant uh, in 16th century, I found out. I didn't know that. But there is a kind of center, an intellectual center there at, in Columbus, Ohio, 
uh, that I'm, uh, I'm I'm very happy that you all of you got together because it seems to me that when you do that, everyone inspires everyone else. That yeah, it's a really great co um, community of of early modern scholars here. With as you say, with uh, well, obviously you know, miss miss John King tremendously. He was a, he was a good friend as well as a, really a mentor and somebody who. Um, he sort of he really hired me here back in 1991, um, and as well as Hannibal, there's uh, we've got Alan Farmer. Alan Farmer, an, yes. I, you know, database of early, early English playbooks. We've got um, Jen Higginbotham who works on Shakespeare and Girlhood, and um, uh, Sarah Neville, who's just published that's right. Um, herbals uh, and print culture. So, yeah, we've got a really sort of rich and diverse group. I should uh, mention that I, I don't know if you noticed, but I dedicated the, the Blackfriars book to John King. I did notice. I did notice. And uh, I, uh, I by, you know, by the time I was I was working on it, he he had retired. But it was John and his fascination with Protestant, early Protestant culture, Reformation writers um, and martyrology, Fox especially, that I am. Um, helped him together we put together a conference on sort of john fox and his world this must yes. have been late 90s it was an international conference we had people like patrick collinson here oh um, yes then we put out a collection of essays with that title john fox and his world and i actually wrote about a catholic martyrology a kind of an answer to fox um by someone called richard verstegen the theatrum crudelitatum yeah an amazing um, woodcut images of you know Protestant heretical atrocities against Catholics, and it was that that sort of got me interested in that the whole Catholic perspective, which yeah. complements John's work on on from the from the Protestant Reformation side really nicely. Yeah, well, in in your work, and uh, I think uh, John uh, went into this too, but in your work uh, on Ireland and Spencer and Shakespeare's uh, way of dealing with Ireland long ago. Uh, was it, we we may forget now how innovative that was at that time, and still is. There still are people who are resistant to this idea of yeah. of uh, of us being able to look into cultural identity formation through the drama. In other words, we're getting a little too far away from the stage. We're getting a little bit too far away from even the page, and uh, and yet. Uh, it to me, it's always fascinating how these dramas work to. Um, what to echo uh, culture that is uh, sur the, the surrounding culture. And then in turn, you see that the dramas themselves have influence on people's th thoughts. You know, there's a two way street there. Yeah. And, you know, I was very fortunate for just, just tell you a little bit about my origins as a, as a, someone who's into, into early modern Renaissance culture, you know, at the university of Sussex, I when I was an undergraduate in the late seventies, early eighties, I got to work with Jonathan Dollimore, and Alan Sinfield, you know, and Dollamore was, was writing radical tragedy at the time. Yes. I, I feel I, I was just in the right place at the right time and that his energy and his uh, interdisciplinary, his very historical, very materialistic approach, you know, rubbed off on me. I just, you know, I just got the bug. Um, yeah. And that was really the start of it. But well, a lot of us, a, a lot of us caught, caught that bud. Uh, yeah. But, you know, in more remote, I was in a much more remote area, but there you were yeah. with with those guys. Yeah. Um, I failed to cross reference that I, I looked at, uh, of course, you know, look, looking over your CV and so forth. And that's right. Dollamore was there. Those were in Sinfield and uh, uh, and, you know, of course, Greenblatt was getting a start. Uh, and uh, yeah. I'm not sure if he was at Berkeley at that time, but I think so. And uh uh, and others uh, who came along, of course, of course, Blaney, uh, <laughs> Blaney, I didn't come across Blaney's work until a few years after it came out. He he didn't pick the most um, <laughs> noticeable place to publish. You know, it's just one of these places in kind of a, the proceeds of um, of a of a museum or something. Uh, and then, you know, but it answers so many questions to me about how this uh, uh, this came about. Uh, also, another person 
uh, the, the, if we're going to go into lineage, of course, Collinson, and there's a whole school of people who studied with Collinson, and you cannot get through uh, cultural history of the drama without coming across these, even though it goes much more into Reformation religion or religion at that time. Um, the 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 lineage there from him, and there's also Richard Dutton. Uh, oh, Dutton, course, well, Dutton was my colleague here. He was your colleague there. That's that's another guy. He, another... he retired, yeah, about six years ago. Yeah. I was, I was also fortunate that I did my graduate work at Stanford, where I worked with Stephen Orgel. Yeah. So I kind oh, of that's right. He was at Stanford. Yes. Yeah, okay. My, my materialism, the more sort of Marxist oriented, a slant from Dollymore and Sinfield. And I got to Stanford with Orgel, who was kind of a new historicist, but also an old historicist, really yeah, you know, working yeah. with sources, very, very careful scholarship. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I have I have to uh, mention him as, as one of a, a huge influence on my work and a mentor. Have you been in uh, contact with him lately, Orgel? Not for a couple of years. Yeah, but, um, I kind constantly. of would like to, to speak with him, too, as part of the series. Oh, I think, yeah, I think he's still yeah. active. Well, he just uh, just released a book. I think it's a collection of essays, if I'm right. But uh, yeah, if you turn around in this business, you turn around one day and then boom, there, here comes a book. And uh, I'd like to ask him about that. But going back to the, the you mentioned uh, Ireland and identity formation and in sort of nation formation, the relationship yeah. between England and those other parts of the, of the um, Atlantic archipelago. Yeah, I mean, that was that was huge wasn't it in the um in the 90s there were people like um before i wrote my book you know i had the, there's the work of andrew hadfield that's right hadfield Ailey, Ailey, yeah. and, and several others um and i don't know whether it really what's been going on in that field of, let's say spencer and an island studies or spencer and colonial studies i, I really i really haven't followed that that line yeah so, whether it's that criticism has become sort of more formalist and uh, sort of inward looking, whether it, I mean, the whole Irish context was exhausted at that in that period of scholarship, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it has become formalist and inward looking uh, from what I've seen. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of people out there doing a lot of things. Um, but uh, that, that uh, someone else to mention is, uh, uh, well, if we go back even further, Mar uh, Martin Ingram, uh, at, uh, um, uh, who worked in the, who put out in the 80s, He's, uh, he was working on uh, this, and, and Martin was over here uh, for a Shakespeare talk. He uh, just, just released a book, and um, of course, Arthur Kinney. Uh, who was uh, my outside reader back in the day and uh, kind of whipped me into shape. I thought, it, I, you know, I kind of brought him in as someone to kind of help me. Uh, he really took it seriously as he took everything very seriously. But what a what a fabulous scholar. But uh, let's let's think about, though, what is coming. Uh, you're working on uh, Henry VIII and afterlives and have been working on Henry VIII and afterlives. And I love this whole afterlife business yeah. uh, because that gets into reception, which was one of my areas. And many of us have worked on that. OK, so that was um, a project that I worked on. I was working on that when I got this idea for the Blackfriars book. And so I've got I've gotten a few articles out of Henry VIII and his reception, but I'm, I'd still like to go back and write a large study. And so this this would focus on the way in which memories of, of Henry's life and of, of the Reformation, you know, the break with Rome, how, how they sort of suddenly um, burst into life, these memories at, at certain critical moments in, in English history. Um, and I'm identifying moments like the restoration like the, wow. uh, the the Cromwellian protectorate period, like the Glorious Revolution, um, when hot winter questions about England being re-Catholicized come up, and mm -hmm. I go I go all the way to um, the Regency period actually, because there are some I discovered some very interesting satirical prints by um, Cruikshank, and mm -hmm. those satirical that that show the discovery of henry's body in the crypt at um, st george's windsor st george's chapel windsor mm -hmm. along with the, the the body of of charles the first because they're buried together 
in in the crypt there at George's, and it was very it was very interesting the other day to see you know the Queen Elizabeth being buried in that exact same well the, the black slab that her coffin was over it says on it it says on that black um, slab this that beneath are the um, the bodies of, of Charles the first and Henry the eighth it's a very kind of simple monument um, and one of so one of the things that I've been interested in is the kind of the failure to commemorate those two monarchs Henry the eighth and Charles the first why didn't they why did they never get grand tombs like um, Elizabeth I got say in Westminster Abbey um, so that's something I've written about yeah but anyway go, going back to Henry and the Regency of course you know the, the Prince Regent the, the future George the fourth he was embroiled in um, divorce divorce with a, a foreign uh, princess and queen Queen Caroline and there were all kinds of uh, connections parallels drawn between um George's sort of marital predicament um, and Henry VIII's. And, and it's often, what really fascinates me also about Henry is the, the way in which his body becomes a kind of a focus for questions of um, sovereignty, um, masculinity, um, male sexuality. It's often the, the body that's the focus of these um, of these moments in history where you know, he suddenly remembered and resurrected, as it were. Yeah, well, in late Shakespeare, this, um, uh, which what was uh, considered is uh, Henry VIII, uh, I think, um, probably a collaboration, and and not not my go-to play. Uh, I think uh, there was a, I mean, Elizabeth was out by then, but still, I, th I think that he was being very careful about. Um, and that's there's a Black Friars connection there because that's yeah. one of what's one of the Shakespeare plays I talk about in the Black Friars book because of course that play was performed um, in the in the sec in the second Black Friars theatre in in that space that was the converted Parliament chamber I mean and that is where the the proceedings against Catherine of Aragon had actually taken place in that very same space where this play is now several decades later reenacting you know the um the interrogation of, of Catherine of Aragon and the the investigation in, into the marriage and whether it was legitimate or not yeah my argument is that the, the, there are these sorts of m memories of the of this of this painful and conflicted reformation past memories kind of embedded in, in the very space of the second Blackfriars theater um and that Shakespeare is and Fletcher are Sort of consciously activating those memories in, yeah. in play and stirring up, um, you know, memories of the Reformation, fears of uh, whether the Reformation will be reversed or where, whether it, you know, what's going to happen in the future around the um, sort of the end of the first decade of the 17th century. But well, that's, it's just yeah. such a, a resonant, multi layered space because, you know, it, it was the, for the friars, it had been the, um, it had been the, the refectory, it had been known as the Great Chamber, but it also served as a um, a home for Parliament before the that's Reformation. That's right. Parliament met On, that's, the, yes, that's where they deliberated the uh, the question of Catherine of Aragon. Uh, yeah. Yes, okay. Um, uh, right there, in, in, right the, in the Priory, yeah. Yeah. Um, because if you're in London and you need a big space for uh, this kind of deliberation, then there are not that many places. Uh, and yeah, basically got Westminster Hall um, and the, these these spaces in the in the priories and friaries and what have you. If, at least before the Reformation. Yeah. Um, well, I, I want to go in a, a little different direction, Master of Rebels, but, and this is very selfish. I do this usually in every talk. I do something extremely selfish, but I've been working on the um, uh, St. John's Clerkenwell, uh, oh. that uh, Tilney's uh, residence and the Office of the Rebels after uh, Cowarden, and I think it was Tilney, uh, well, of course, Tilney throughout Shakespeare's career, but the Office of the Rebels moved out to St. John's. Yeah. But I don't know if St. John's at that area uh, is that part of what you are going to be doing. Are you? Do you stay within the gates, or can you go out over to the northwest where that area was? Smithfield. Out in my future mapping project. 
Yeah. Um, no, I'm going to stay with within the the Blackfriars precinct within the parish of, of St Anne's Blackfriars. Oh, just there, uh, right? Okay, that's yeah, enough. But, uh, the the people I'm working with, they're interested in um, St Giles Cripplegate, and then um, a parish towards the west where the cockpit is is located. Yeah. Uh, well, this is, I'm, I'm kind of trying to pull a, a ship into port on shallow water here a little bit, but the um, the um, memory theorists that have kind of risen out of the, after the people we discussed earlier, uh, and uh, the idea of uh, sites of memory that uh, have uh, along that line, uh, Anita Sherman at uh, yeah. American you did an article that just uh, really influenced me talking about that and the fact that Blackfriars is is remembered better than uh, than uh, the uh, Office of the Revels during uh, you know the um, yeah. uh, St. John's uh, period and she wrote on that and uh, went into memory theorists and wondered, we, we're wondering why some things are remembered and some things are not remembered. And of course, one one reason would be their geophysical location. Uh, um, but, but St. John's Clerkenwell, is, that's a, has survived to this day in, in really good condition. Yeah, yeah. So visited, it is, it is open to the public. And in fact, they put in a whole new sort of visitor center They've they read they've redone all that since I was there a few years ago, so it might be worth visiting too. Yeah, and there's a good uh, they're bringing in the the story about the about the Revels office and its connection with that space. Yeah, there. Um, this <laughs> Mola put out this uh, yeah. publication about twenty years ago, I think. Uh, it was more detail than uh, I'm I'm able to, you know. Um, the, process. You know whether, whether the office was actually in in St John's Gate. You know that. Yeah, St that? John's Gate. Yes. Gate. Yeah. I've never visited, uh, but uh, it was, uh, again, repurposed. Uh, and I guess one reason I talked about destruction, part of it was blown up. Uh, Somerset had some, uh, he, he uh, <laughs> the uh, Charnel Chapel at St. Paul's that uh, Blaney talks about, uh, that was, a, a, I think, uh, a Somerset project. He wanted these stones for yeah. the Somerset house. And he had something going on with uh, blowing up something at the uh, at St. John, uh, St. John's in uh, in Clarkenwell. Uh, so there, of, there was a Stowe might talk about because he's very attuned in the Survey of London to the way in which these nouveau riche, you know, people are destroying the traditional buildings and infrastructure of London or violating people's property to get to get raw materials like stone to build their grand mansions you know yeah their show houses yeah um and i'm also interested in th there was a graveyard in uh the in the black fires complex there was a, a graveyard yes. I'm, I'm interested in that too because of course st paul's famously they destroyed the uh chapel the charnel chapel and moved the bones according to stowe mm -hmm. out uh, oh, Stowe, by the way, doesn't say much about St. John's. Uh, and I think that he, he may have felt that it had been... Um, uh, have you looked in the later editions of Stowe? There's the Antony Monday, like 1620 or something. And then you get I, Stripes, uh, 18th century um, version of Stowe, which obviously it adds a lot of stuff from, from late, the later 17th century. And that's available um, online. It's searchable. Okay. And, it's very different. I mean, it, it, it has a lot of new stuff that's not in the original. Yeah. So well, again, that, that's the, the um, uh, Aegis map and the um, uh, map of early modern London site has uh, Stowe available, uh, open access. Oh, yeah. But I'm, yeah. I'm asking you three questions at the same time. But the uh, uh, the thing is that, yeah, well, let's go back to uh, burial uh, and the... Okay. Yeah, because that interests me because of personal reasons, you know, you know, you have friends, you know where they're buried and so forth. And uh, these these mass, this movement of bones and bodies. Uh, and, you know, the, you would think that there would be like there may, may have been a resistance to a playhouse. There would have been some localized resistance to the removal of remains during these periods. 
Right. So in Black Friday, you've got what was called the conventual church. That's in the northern range, right? Mm -hmm. The and that's that's turned into the great house, the Coordon Moor Great House. So there would have been burials in there. And then the north, the churchyard where um lay people could be buried as well before the Reformation, as well as well as um, you know, the clergy. That that was to the north of the conventual church. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure whether whether burials were taking place there after the Reformation. I know that burials were taking taking place in the church in what was referred to as the church porch of the new St Anne's Parish Church after the Reformation, and also taking place in the vault beneath the new. St. When I when I say new, I mean it's it's basically um, and it's a con the new parish church. It's basically a converted space a repurposed space again it's not a purpose-built church as we as we think of those anglo-norman churches in london today it may have been a, con the con a conversion of the old chapter house i believe so because um, in lots of the wills i read people will say i wish to be buried in the porch you know next to my spouse or near my brother-in-law or you know they talk about specific locations yes so never talking about being buried in the the graveyard of course you know people the people who can make wills tend to have the status and the money that will allow them to get that in that prestigious burial inside the church itself or in the vault yeah yes. i was looking at nick holder's map i brought it up here and there's a principal yeah. principal graveyard on the north side uh That's, on the Ludg nick Holder's work i i i lean heavily on that because he's an archaeologist and he's yeah done some very very good mapping and, of the and, right after the Reformation. Well, that's where I saw the preaching cross, right next to the principal graveyard. Oh, okay. So that, but that yeah. would have disappeared after the Reformation, certainly by the a after by the, the Reformation. Reformation. Okay, so yeah, that's so later. I'm looking at there's no reference to preaching crosses. Yeah, yeah. No, that's definitely gone. Yeah, but you know the, the huge long history. Well, of course, I'm bringing all this up because of Hamlet. <laughs> you know, I, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, the Hamlet's always uh, <clears throat> kind of intrigued us because of this. Why is he in the graveyard at the beginning of Act Five? He's coming back to get his revenge, and suddenly he's in a graveyard. And, yeah. And uh, you know, the more I learn about London, the more I know that you are really not far away from a graveyard. Never if, far from from a graveyard, are you? Yeah. Or no, bones. You know, yeah. You know the book, this new book. Um. Oh, I'm going to forget the name of it now. It's written by the the head of the the theatre, sort of the theatre department of the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, and it's about St Helen's Bishopsgate and Shakespeare's time living there. We know he lived there from the um, subsidy reports and, and other documents that tell us he didn't pay his taxes. We know he lived there for a few years. I think in the late 1590s. Um, living with Shakespeare, so the book's called Living with Shakespeare, but he yeah. talks a lot. He talks a lot about the graveyard there in St Helen's Bishop's Gate and the proximity of to some of the residences that where Shakespeare may have lodged to the graveyard. And if I recall co correctly, because I actually re I reviewed the book, and I'm, I'm ashamed I can't remember these the author's <laughs> name. Talks about Shakespeare may and a lot is very speculative, maybe looking over the graveyard as he composed Hamlet. So you should definitely check that out. It, it's pretty new. It only came out recently. Yeah. Um, and he, the 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 author, he, he's done some fantastic work, again, looking at original sources, not just parish records, but tax records, subsidy, you know, lay subsidy um, records and things like that. He's done a real, lot of digging um, because, you know, we know very, very little. There's very little hard evidence about where Shakespeare and what he was doing when he lived in St. Helens Bishop's Gate. I think we know a lot more ab about Shakespeare's time with the Mountjoys, right, on Silver Street. Uh, yes. Charles Nick has written that fantastic book about Shakespeare on Silver Street. Yes. Very, it's, uh, it's still a very, very a really good su study. Yes, and uh, and all of these things are so uh, cross-disciplinary yeah. uh, that sometimes it's hard I, one critic I did want to bring up is uh, someone who influenced your uh, your Blackfriars uh, research is Vanessa Harding, 
Oh uh, yeah. Who also did work on the dead, the you know the living and the yeah. dead in Paris and London. Uh, what a brilliant scholar uh, and what brilliant yeah. work she's done. Yes. Yeah, um, and it was through Vanessa's work that I discovered this thing called the new graveyard. Have you have you heard about this? Uh, the, it was, you know, these little parishes, their graveyards were so crowded. Yes. And I, I can't give you a year for the establishment of the new graveyard, but it was, you know, an attempt to help with this, um, to help parishes. But a lot of the, um, quite, I think quite a few of the strangers uh, or the, you know, the, the, the foreign residents who'd come, the, these Huguenot settlers, and where there are many, many living in Black Friars. I, I talk a lot about them in the book. Yes. But they didn't have graveyards attached to the French church on Threadneedle Street or to the Dutch church at Austin Friars. All right. So th those spaces were gifted to the these foreign communities by, by Edward VI. So they have they, they always had a problem, I think, finding places to bury their dead. Um, and this is partly the partly the new graveyard served their needs as well. Uh yeah, and they, uh, of course, the big graveyard was Paul's Cross Churchyard, and that's what I'm thinking. You know, there you have graveyard, uh, and I know they stopped uh, accepting bodies at some point, but then they still had to accept. Uh, Vanessa Harding says they still took bodies from parish churches because those churchyards were filled, and of course, Paul's Cross was having a problem uh, too to Paul's Cross Churchyard, but you know, the whole idea of this whole churchyard surrounded by bookstores, which is the center of novelty, you know, as you're, uh, you know, you're going to see all this new stuff and you're walking and there had to be times when some people kind of came back up. They didn't do the burials that well for commoners. Uh, and this is why most parishes employ dog whippers because dogs would dig up the bodies. The graves were very shallow. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, typically on the parish, um, you know, roll roll call, you, you'd have a dog whipper who was to get rid of stray dogs and stop this from happening. Someone who uh, professionally, oh, wow. someone who professionally whipped dogs. I think there's an image of that in the uh, 16, is it the 1660? There's an image, a famous image of Paul's cross. Of, yeah, the Gil Gilpkin, isn't it? Or something like yes, that. Yes, that's it, the Gilpkin image. And uh, yeah. I think there's an image, of, there's certainly a dog it might be a dog whipper in there. No, I think it is. The, the, his, the historian John Craig, I don't know if yeah. you're familiar with his work, yeah. really great work on sort of on parishes and all the different administrative positions and official positions there were on the books. He talk, he's he got a whole essay on dog whippers, basically. Oh, okay. Well, let's check that out. What a, what a great idea, these uh, these things. Well, uh, we're all over the place, but I think we're almost there. But uh what yeah tell us what's coming up because you're you're still working you know what it's sort of in this business what have you done for us lately uh chris <laughs> you know you you think that after a book you would get some time off but you uh are are charging ahead and i think uh we talked about henry what other things are going on so, so i've got this digital black friars project which we're currently applying for an NEH grant. Uh -huh. um, so we'll see what happens with that. But I've got a whole bunch of um, kind of articles that are spin-offs from the book. Mater I mean, I, I just had so much primary material that I couldn't fit it all in. So I have an, a, a book history essay on um, the library of Sir Thomas Posthumus Hobie. Uh -huh. Margaret, Lady Margaret Hobie's husband, yeah, Margaret Hobie of, the di of diary fame. Um, How do you get the name posthumous? <laughs> How on the, who who oh, gives well, you that name? His his father died while he was still inside his mother. Okay, so I mean, I, I think it's a great name, <laughs> posthumous. So, but he, you know, he was one of the godly of Black Friars. Yeah, but also his estates were up in in Hackness in the East Riding of Yorkshire, and his books ended up at York Minster. They were part of a parish library at the end uh -huh. of the. Stuff. So I'm just I'm just looking at you know what what kind of books he collected, what he read, and what they tell us about his his whole mentality, and you know, but but again, it, it kind of what what I'm trying to do is to just question some of the assumptions that we make about these 
theater hating kind of pleasure hating puritans it's never that simple once you no, sort of lives of these people it's much more nuanced so I'm, I'm doing that i'm also really interested in the the women in blackfriars because in the second petition uh, against the theater 1619 um again it, it failed but um the major constituency who has, who signed the petition are uh are women mostly single women widows um spinsters and, and women who actually live together uh, under one roof quite a few of them so I'm, I'm really interested in the kind of godly community they formed and how they latched on to to william googe the famous preacher there yes i am too and in midsummer night's dream which i'm teaching now i know you know right at the beginning there's the image of the dowager you know the the, the dowager holding back and not uh i guess signing off so the, the oldest son can get the uh inheritance and then uh of course the young lovers are going to the dowager aunt right and i think there's just something more going on there of course, these dowagers are earlier on that you're talking about, uh, I think. Are you, are you thinking of uh, the, the dowager duchess, Lady Elizabeth Russell? That's right. Yes, yeah. that's I mean, right. Uh, are, are we in the 1590s? Yes, we're, if we're yeah. with the petition, we're in the 1590s. Yeah. And that she's, would... she's the, the lead signatory on the 1596 petition. Um, although we don't know that petition of 96, the, the extant copy is, is a copy probably from later in the 17th century, and the scribe didn't necessarily follow the order of names in the original, okay? But, right. but her name is at the top of that 1596 petition that's, that's in the public rec, that's in the National Archives in London. Hmm, I wonder how well known, you know, what type of personality uh, we're dealing with and whether, you know, that it's highly speculative, but it, it just is interesting to me there are two there are two dowagers right at the beginning of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, which is sort of bang on this period, you know, well, mid you 1590s. Read, uh, Chris, Chris Latouris's book. Do no. You, do you know Shakespeare and the Countess? Ah, I know it, yes. Yeah, yeah. It might have had a different title when it, when it came out in the US as opposed to England. Yeah. But he makes direct parallels between, I think, um, like Twelfth Night and the character Malvolio, he thinks is a could be a dig at the Hobies. Um, I've, I'm not sure if he mentions tw um, Midsummer Night's Dream, but that's that would be worth having a look at. But he's done a lot of great work on yeah. specifically on La Lady Russell. Yeah, she, she is absolutely fascinating a character. Yeah, well, that's something I'm. I, I, I like doing this, even if I'm not writing on it. I like. I just like it. I, I like the idea that you might be able. You know, of course, some of these uh, characters in these plays are composites and so forth. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's, in, in my case, teaching in a uh, situation where second language, so much more explication has to be done. And it just really tests my, the limits of my understanding of, you know, what how people refer to horses and, you know, the uh, what yesterday it was uh, the Jade's trick and uh, much ado about nothing. Of course, that's the, the horse uh, escaping being, uh, you know, bridled. And you yeah. have to know that in order to explain it. And that this, so, yes, I'm constantly pushed there in a line to line, word to word level with some of my students. It's just the same in Ohio. It's just the same because there's 400, you know, you, and yeah, the. Uh, uh, I know that the Jan Cott the years ago was Shakespeare, our contemporary. I, I agree. There's a lot of contemporary stuff, but there is a lot of history that you have to know in order to get through one of these uh, dramas, uh, Shakespeare or contemporaries, through throughout. Um, one of the, I was just going to say one one of the, um, the sort of the highlights of my teaching is that I I do get to teach relatively small seminars on special topics. Yeah, and I've offered a, a series of courses that are sort of centered on on Tudor and Stuart monarchs. I've done a, a course on Elizabeth I, life, literature, and legend, which I've, I've offered many times. I've done one on Henry VIII, and I'm doing so teaching for the first time on on James, James I. So we're looking at Macbeth and the Tempest in relation to James's own writings and to the sort of political and social discourses circulating around the time. And I think that really, that the students do do like that. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's so fascinating. Arthur, Arthur Kenny did an article years ago about the the uh, parallels in Macbeth and uh, James's own background. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, the, yeah. the, the, there were uh, just extraordinary. I, uh, oh, it had to do. It's so detailed. And it was years since I've read it. Uh, but uh, having to do with, um, you know, Darnley and uh, explosions and, and how these come up in Macbeth and how it must have just uh, been. But of course, Orgel also wrote on uh, James I uh, brilliantly uh, in that kingship. He would, so. Uh, well, uh, yeah, he did a lot. Of, Orgel edited the, the Oxford edition of The Tempest. Yeah. And a, a lot of the context there has, has to do with, you know, royal marriages, the, the alliance between. Elizabeth uh, Elizabeth Stuart and the um, the Elector Palatine and then the proposed marriage for Prince Henry to the Spanish Infanta, because that that all it's all happening around the time that Shakespeare's working on the Tempest and of course the Tempest is actually performed at Whitehall as part of the betrothal ceremony for Elizabeth and the um, the Elector. Ah yes, which which occurs in the wake of the, the sudden death of Prince Henry in 1612 yeah yeah but I, i'm i'm pleased i actually got my students to read most of basilican doron which i never thought i'd accomplish <laughs> well, you are you are inspiring them uh, th is this a graduate class now, these are undergrads wow yeah. yeah um well aaron has said nothing but great things to say about his education at ohio state you know he said he was a you know young kid so you know sort of misdirected and he just he's from not far away and just sort of yeah. went down the street to go to ohio state and he ran into this uh, stuff that just absolutely these people and professors who absolutely changed the course of his life and of course inspired him and uh he, yeah and we've oh, had um, aaron pratt we've had him uh, give lectures to the um we have we have what's here what's called the center for medieval and renaissance studies yes yes uh, and i'm actually the, the i've been the director for the past few years and we have um you know individual lectures then we have symposiums i think we did one on the history of the book a few years ago and aaron pratt spoke at that yeah um this year our, our topic is environmental environments and sustainability in medieval and early modern britain or the early modern worlds. So we're kind of all over the place. You know, we pick a different topic each year. Yeah. Well, it was my responsibility to bring that up uh, earlier in this uh, talk, but there's so much to consider and I don't want to miss anything. Uh, Blackfire, this is just a lot going on at Ohio State University. Sure and, uh, uh, and so, and you're in Columbus now. And yep. uh, of course, uh, do you have any, um, well, this year, you should be able to return to London with your students uh, in, in May to resume the normal course of... Oh, we were there last May. Oh, you were? Okay. We resumed last May, um, but the two years before that, we missed out. Yeah. And I... then we've already, we're already planning to go back um, May of May 2023. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, the, the only other thing that I have, and we'll kind of... Uh, taper off with this though i did see in your work this kind of diametrically opposed uh, notion of, of of neighborhood and community and exiles you have exiles yeah. you, you deal with uh, exile and also community and this they, they're together and diamet you know like peace and war they're they're um, diametrically opposed but also intertwined but do talk a lot about the, the catholic exiles um in in my um catholics writing the nation book and of course, the, these are the the exiles who have and many, many of them are, are professors from Oxford and Cambridge who go either to, um, you know, the Catholic low countries to these places like uh, Louvain um, and do, college, colleges and seminaries at Reims and Douai, or they go to to Spain and to places like Valladolid. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, they're, they're trying to form communities themselves. They're, they're trying to. They've, they've got the, their, their small kind of confessional communities within within those centres, um, and they're trying to build bonds back with Catholics in in the homeland, as it were. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't see I don't see exile and, and community building as as being um, sort of inconsistent. Yeah. Um, well, there's sort of <laughs> exile kind of accelerates, um, intensifies the need to to create a sense of belonging and a shared identity. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, th this, though, is uh, excellent an excellent contribution because the Marian exiles tend to take over, you know, they uh, get yeah. a lot of space in, in Reformation uh, writing and uh, the people tend to forget that they're also um, uh, exiles on, on the other side there too. I think there's been some really, since I wrote that book, there's been some really great work, especially on women religious, on, on nuns, on the, the English, Welsh, um scots irish who went to the continent and the kinds of communities they formed because i mean many many of them were engaged in intellectual work as translators and even write writers of um you know pole polemics and there's this there are huge projects now on the the, the, the nuns of uh, the counter-reformation in, in europe a lot of a lot of sort of databases up there now so i need, I need to acknowledge that work um yeah uh, well, of course, I'm drawn to this because uh, you spoke earlier about uh, your education, undergraduate education at Sussex, and then uh, suddenly I see you over in Southern California, uh, and you, you know, not many people leave uh, Sussex to go to uh, Southern <laughs> California, so that is a kind of exile. I don't know how that, yeah, yeah and that's your private life, or your personal life, but that's interesting. And then we'll to Stanford, all... up north to Stanford. Yeah, I, I think at some level we always write about ourselves, even if we don't realize that. And so for me, someone who was brought up in a uh, very conventional, sort of conservative Protestant household, um, English Protestant household, you know, wanting to write about the, the Anglo-Irish relationship, the Irish other, that was kind of a reaction, I think. To, to attitudes in my family that would, um, you know, just dismiss Ireland. I mean, the, in my family growing up in the 1970s, the, the idea of ever visiting Ireland uh, um, was just, you know, was never never considered. So that was my sort of interest in, in Ireland. And then that led obviously into Catholicism. Um, may, maybe my interest in, in London and then these, these tiny communities in London has got something to do with the fact that I'm not a Londoner, that I grew up in the north of England near Manchester, yeah. but I've always been fascinated by by London as this kind of magical place, mysterious place that I visit. I remember visiting as a kid, maybe as a 10, 11 year old when my, my sister was in college in, in London, going and just, um, you know, just seems so such a, a world unto itself so special and so that i guess that fascination has lingered yeah but you ended up in california uh yeah. is there is there a, and and now ohio for years is there a sense of exile there uh and reforming community yeah i, I think so at some level yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, of course I, I i'm in tokyo which is yeah. not not where i was born <laughs> so uh, this sort of thing interests me. Uh, but I, I don't feel um, sort of alienated or what's the word? Um, expatriated? Do you feel like an expatriate? In the... A little bit. But I mean, I've been here so long and I've been I've been at Ohio, I'm at Ohio State 30 years. Yeah. And um, my children are born in America. My wife's American. Yeah. I get back every year to England. I, I feel comfortable in both environments. Yeah. Although when, when I take American students, Ohio, Ohio, well, not all from Ohio, but American students to, to England, they most of them come back and say, gosh, you know, I wish we lived in England. Can't stand America anymore. So, but I'm a bit more tolerant maybe of, of America than some people who were born and grew up here can be. Well, you're taking them there in May. Let let them uh, let them spend a the winter there uh, and see what they yeah. say. Yeah, of course it it can it can get cold in Ohio, but it's not like um you know something falling from the sky for uh, months at a time. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I uh, I grew up in the American South, so I had the same sort of um, um I don't know if it's a contemptuous. Um, you know, the I remember going to California to the uh, Claremont Colleges for a master's degree and going, OK, I'm getting out of the South finally, you know, and it was in Orange County. It was, it was just a South Carolina again without the accent. Everybody outside the university was very conservative. You know, these are the people who elected Nixon and Reagan. 
Sure. Uh, and so uh, I was a little disappointed, but, uh, you know, then ended up in uh, Japan for many years. But when I do see the notion of exile and community and so forth, uh, it catches my interest. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, in terms of um, uh, many of us who have traveled as scholars, and necessarily so, because you have to follow where the uh, good jobs are. And yeah. uh, and uh, and I think you ended up in uh, just this fabulous circumstance uh, uh, in, in your career. Uh, well, uh, I, I can't uh, I can't express how much I appreciate you coming on, Chris. Uh, we we have a small but very enthusiastic audience here. Um, right. At some point, you know, if we ever if you ever we can get you over here or something like that. I would love to come. In fact, I've got a nephew who's lived in Tokyo for 10 years. Um, well, I'll tell you this much. I mean, it's, it's hard now to get uh, money uh, for travel for some reason, but if you get here, we can, uh, we can set you up. Uh, for, yeah. I, I, uh, could, some... I could apply, apply for travel money. If I've got an invitation. To uh, give it to absolutely we can do seminars. oh we can, we can do uh seminars we can do talks that is easy and we can okay. do um uh, so get get over here and uh and come talk to uh, our students and our uh, of course the um there there are people in the shakespeare society of japan they're probably a little bit disappointed in me because i missed our last meeting uh because we had um we had graduate school duties uh um, yeah no definitely weekend, but, uh, definitely yeah. But yeah, I think they'll forgive me. A few years, because as, as I say, my um, all of my family have been to visit my nephew in Tokyo, and they've always just been so overwhelmed by the experience and telling me I've got to go, I've got to go. And to tell you the truth, the only thing holding me back is just treading this uh, such a long flight. Well, don't worry about that so much. Uh, the the real reason you couldn't get over here is because they wanted you to test negative before you came, and now yeah. that's that's dropped. Okay. And uh, they want you to have an itinerary and, and all of this stuff. But I think all of that's dropping off now. Uh, the flight is, um, <laughs> we'll, we can talk privately about how to endure the flight. I've done enough of them where I get uh, usually get a little better seat and so forth. But it isn't as bad as as uh, as, uh, as you might think it is. So, uh, what will be the best months to come, do you think? May, again, but uh, best months, May or October. Right now, uh, and I'm thinking of weather in terms because in the summer it gets very hot in Tokyo, and of course in the winter months, the like January February we're doing end of term examination entrance examination stuff, that uh, and no students are around, so April May June and uh, October November good. Okay. Uh, well, April April June would would be the probably the best. So I'll I'll give it a thing. I'll get in and get in touch with you uh late april okay it's good uh and yeah please do and anytime and i'll put you in touch with uh other uh or i'll send out that you're coming in and there'll be other invitations forthcoming from my uh, japanese colleagues and other universities oh, that'd uh, be wonderful. Thank, thank you so much Tom. yeah Speaking. well i mean we we felt ex we felt a bit exiled here as shakespeareans from the uh world because we i had to miss a conference this two conferences this past summer because of um, the trouble about getting back into Japan, you know, with uh, testing. So, uh, so we're hungry. We're hungry for uh, some uh, okay. new stuff. And Blackfriars just right down the alley of some of my colleagues. And maybe you'd like to give a talk at some point to the uh, Center for Medieval Renaissance Studies. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you, you know, we can do that via Zoom. If you prefer, we're still Zooming people in. I, well, I would be delighted. I, I you know, you, <laughs> I have fresh stuff on graveyards, but you, you've given me another really source to consider. But uh, I, there are other things that maybe are a little bit more. It's a little morbid, uh, but uh, oh, connections. No, no, no. I sounds fascinating. Uh, I do have something coming out on the office of the rebels if it ever comes out. I mean, this. Oh my! It's been about four years since. Uh, you know, the uh, COVID really slowed up some publications, but uh, I had something on St. John's that I think would might be. Great. 
And uh, so, yeah, I would love to, love to by Zoom or in person if that's possible. So, looking for that as well. Yeah. Uh, but get over here and yeah. uh, <laughs> we can have some fun. Oh, yeah. Tokyo's a lot of fun. And uh, your, is it your nephew you said? Your nephew? Yeah, my sister's youngest son. Yeah, yeah. Well, we so love he- having visitors here because we get to go see things that we don't go see in our normal lives because we feel, and then we always, you go, why don't I do this all the time? But you don't, you get into your routine. And uh, when someone comes to visit, you go out to see these great things, you know, cause hey, let's go look at things. So we love having uh, visitors. I'm sure he will too, yeah. Oh yeah, he, he loves showing people around. Yeah, yeah. It sounds Excellent. fantastic, let's make, let's make it a plan. Okay, Chris, thank you so much. And uh, just stay for one moment here. I'm gonna uh, say goodbye. Thank you so much for, joining us and, uh, in, you know, taking time out of your busy schedule. We've, I've talked to you through your supper time, so you're probably a little hungry, so I'll, I'll let you go. Well, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure.